Um, so let me start with a bit of motivation. Uh, you, you expect me to say that j holomorphic curves are great things. Uh, that is, of course, something that I feel strongly about. Uh, I think it becomes a, an incontrovertible statement when you look at something like uh, early results by Gromov and Macduff, like this one was first sketched in Gromov's 1985 paper, um, where you suppose you just have a symplectic four manifold. You don't know what it is, except it's symplectically minimal. Uh, it's not a blow up of anything. And it contains a symplectically embedded sphere with self-intersection one. Now you can turn that into a J-holomorphic sphere. And then you can construct a moduli space out of that, which if you say add a constraint so that you just look at curves going through uh, some fixed point, that becomes a two-dimensional space and the curves start spreading out and filling up space in your unknown manifold. And by the time you prove everything you can about that moduli space with holomorphic curves, you have a picture that tells you this unknown manifold has to be CP2 and its symplectic structure has to be at least proportional to the standard one, the Fubini duty form. And uh, so this argument is based fundamentally on uh, an analytical fact that the moduli space of, let's say, J holomorphic curves with genus G uh, in a given homology class A modulo reparameterization is a compact smooth manifold of a certain dimension that comes from a computation involving the Riemann Roch formula. Now, I would like to give you a bit of commentary on that from Luke Skywalker. Every word in that sentence was wrong. Uh, let's elaborate on that. So I said it's a compact smooth manifold of a certain dimension. Um, first thing is we know it's not actually compact. It is compactifiable. It has a natural compactification coming from Gromov's compactness theorem. That's something you can easily spin as good news rather than bad news. It, it makes life more interesting in a lot of situations. For instance, uh, the interaction between the uncompactified and compactified moduli space gives us interesting things like quantum homology. Um, but there's some worse news coming up. For instance, every J holomorphic curve has a multiple cover. Those multiple covers have symmetry built in. So this D bar operator in zero set is the space of holomorphic curves is always going to be equivariant. And if you have to divide by finite group actions, you're not always going to get a manifold. You'll sometimes have finite stabilizer groups. The best you could hope for is you'll get a smooth orbifold of the right dimension. But then if you're being really honest about the analysis, you have to add a caveat to that and say, this is a true statement, compactifiable smooth orbifold of dimension blah, blah, blah. If the bar operator is transverse to the zero section, meaning the moduli space is also say is transversely cut out, and now you have a real problem because what you would like to do is perturb your auxiliary choice of almost complex structure. But no matter how you do that, the D-bar operator is still going to be equivariant. So you're always making equivariant perturbations and equivariant transversality is in general not possible, at which point you might say, actually J holomorphic curves are not great, they're terrible, I hate them, let's do combinatorics instead. So, I want to give you a bit of good news about this. I'm not going to tell you that, um, that equivariant transversality problems can always be solved. Sometimes they definitely can't, but sometimes they can. And it's possible to recognize when that's possible and when it's not. So I want to try and clarify in this talk questions like, how do we recognize when equivariant transversality is possible and here's a, a statement that would be difficult to formulate as a precise theorem, so I'll just call it a claim. In many settings, if equivariant transversality is possible, then it actually holds generically. So I'll tell you more precisely what I mean by that later. On the other hand, sometimes it's not possible. If not, I want to tell you why it's not possible. And there may be other nice things that are true instead, for instance, 
notions of queen intersections, which give you obstruction bundles, which you can then use to make calculations of invariance. And then in a more general sense, a lot of the ideas that I will describe are applicable for a fairly general range of problems. You might want to try and apply these to your own favorite nonlinear elliptic PDE with symmetry, which is different from mine. And I want to try and clarify what technical results you would need to prove in order to make that possible. So I will consider three general classes of problems. First, there's a finite dimensional uh, sort of toy model where we just look at the zero set of a section of a finite dimensional Orbi bundle over an Orbi fold. Um, I stress that I'm making no claim of originality about any theorems on that subject. I'm just going to tell you some things that I figured out I know how to prove using the ideas I'm describing. And similarly, there's an infinite dimensional case, which is, as infinite dimensional cases go, kind of a toy model. That's the space of closed orbits of an oriented line field. And uh, if you're interested in dynamics on contact manifolds, for instance, you can apply these ideas to uh, grave orbits for contact forms. Uh, again, there I don't claim any originality in the things I'm going to state. I do claim some originality in what I'll say about the moduli space of j homomorphic curves. Before I go further, I want to add uh, mention of a few people whose ideas have been really helpful in developing what I'm going to describe. One is Cliff Taubes. In particular, uh, there was a paper called Counting Pseudo-Holomorphic Submanifolds uh, something something in 1996 that uh, gives the complete definition of the Gromov invariant. So several of, of the important ideas I'm going to describe are, are generalizations of stuff that appeared in that paper. Uh, and some of it has also been influenced by some more recent work by Alexander Duan and Thomas Walpuski and also discussions with them, which influences my way of thinking about this stuff. All right, so let's look at the toy model. We suppose M is a compact n-dimensional orbifold. E is an orbit bundle of rank M over this orbifold uh, question. Is it true that for generic sections of this orbit bundle, the zero set is a sub orbifold of the correct dimension? That would be n minus m in this case, because that's what would be true by the implicit function theorem if uh, your section is transverse to the zero section generically. And the answer is easy to see. Typically, this is not going to be true. So here's a nice local example you can describe. Uh, locally, a certain orbifold, a two dimensional orbifold with a rank two orbi bundle uh, whose sections are the Z2 equivariant functions from R2 to R2, satisfying this particular condition. Let's see if I know how to use my pointer. There. Um, so we've got two different Z2 actions acting by xy to x minus y on the domain and just changing the sign on the fibers. And it's pretty easy to see that although you would love to be able to make this thing transverse to the zero section and get a discrete set at the zero set, that's never going to work because sigma of x comma zero is always going to be zero under that condition. So the zero set will never be discrete. It will always contain this one dimensional submanifold r times zero. So well, what would be the next best thing you could hope for possibly? That would be kind of a more spot condition. So we say that a section intersects the zero section cleanly if all components of the zero set are smooth sub folds. Their dimensions are potentially will vary. They're going to be always greater than or equal to the virtual dimension, n minus m in this case. Uh, when you have that condition, the tangent space to those components is always going to be contained in the kernel of the linearized operator, the linearized section at each point. So that kernel will be at least that large. The condition for clean intersections, that kernel should be exactly that large, no larger than it needs to be. 
So that makes the dimension of the kernel constant. It follows that the dimension of the co-kernel is also constant on each of those components. That gives you a well-defined vector bundle, we call that an obstruction bundle. And, and by general nonsense, if you want to answer a question like, what is the number of zeros that a generic section of this orbit bundle should have if we could make it transverse? In other words, what is its Euler number? Uh, then the answer will be, it's the sum over all the components of this zero set of the Euler numbers of the obstruction bundle on those components. So having clean intersections gives you nice applications like that where you can compute invariance. So here's, I call this a sample theorem because again, I don't claim any originality. I don't even claim that this is necessarily interesting, but it's something that we can prove and I'll explain a little bit how. In the situation where you expect discrete zeros where the, the dimension of m equals the rank of e, and if you also have a condition that the isotropy groups of your orbifold are at most order three at every point, then generic sections will intersect the zero set of section cleanly. So that applies in particular to the example we gave before where transversality is not possible. So I will mention one of the key observations behind the proof of this, which I'll have to clarify later. It, it will not be clear at the moment why this is relevant. But the reason for this condition that the order of the isotropic groups should be at most three is that groups of order up to three have the nice property that they only have two real irreducible representations. That's basically the fact we're going to use in the proof. I'll explain later why that's relevant. So second sample theorem, I did find a reference for this one. There's a, an old paper by Wasserman that's relevant. And then more recently, Hepworth proves precisely this statement, but by a different argument. Generic smooth functions on an orbifold satisfy the Morse condition. Critical points are non degenerate <coughs> in spite of the symmetry. So that's a situation where you actually do get equivariant transversality. The key observation behind that one, which again, we'll have to clarify why it's relevant, is self-adjoint Fredholm operators always have index zero. That's a very general fact. Uh, in particular, the Hessian of a critical point of a function is a self-adjoint Fredholm operator. Which, uh, this is just a statement that symmetric matrices are square in finite dimensions. It's a bit less trivial in infinite dimensions, but still true. So the second problem I'm going to talk about, just to sketch in general what we'll do, um, let's say we have a manifold with an oriented line field, uh, for instance, generated by a nowhere zero vector field R. And we consider the moduli space of closed orbits. So by closed orbit, I mean an immersion of S1 into the manifold, which is everywhere tangent to the line field. And then we're going to call two orbits equivalent if they're reparameterizations of each other. So dividing by the, the obvious group action of diff S1. Diff S1 is infinite dimensional and not a very nice group to work with. So we're going to simplify that a little bit into something you can divide by S1 by talking about periodic orbits of this chosen vector field R up here. So, um, what we're talking about now is solutions of the equation derivative of gamma minus some parameter tau times the vector field along gamma is zero. In other words, uh, up to parameterization, that is an orbit of the vector field R, which is periodic then with period tau. So the period is included as a parameter in the variables. And you can present this thing now as the zero set of a smooth section of a Hilbert space bundle pretty easily. We, we take the space of maps of Sobolev class H1, for instance, from S1 into M. Uh, and the fibers over this bundle are sections of class L2 of the pullback tangent bundle. And this guy is a smooth S1 equivariant section of that Hilbert space bundle. So a few more observations. Uh, orbits 
typically will have isotropy groups under the S1 action. If the orbit is default covered, then its isotropy group will be Z mod B. And a standard definition now couched in, in possibly unfamiliar terms, uh, an orbit is non-degenerate if the section I just defined is transverse to the zero section at that orbit. So uh, sample theorem 2a is a statement that will sound completely standard just in maybe a slightly more general context than you're used to. For generic line fields L, all the orbits in this space of closed orbits are non-degenerate. So that moduli space is a zero dimensional manifold. Let's say something a little bit more interesting. So that's a case where again, equivariant transversality works out completely fine. Um, now the question is, what can you say about uh, the space of orbits under generic one parameter deformations? of a line field. So I want to mention two specific types of bifurcations that are well known. There's a birth death bifurcation. The, the picture is you have a pair of closed orbits moving around. They're non-degenerate. As you vary the parameter, they move around smoothly. But at some point, they come closer and closer together. And at some singular value of the parameter, they smash into each other and they become a degenerate orbit. And that thing is not stable anymore. And if you move the parameter a little bit further, it just disappears. There's no more closed orbit there. So here's a nice way to understand that phenomenon. You can define a parametric moduli space that consists of all pairs S and gamma, where S is the parameter you're varying. Gamma will be a closed orbit for the line field at parameter S. Now, since we added a parameter in the definition, that moduli space no longer wants to be a zero dimensional manifold, it wants to be one dimensional. And for instance, it's pretty easy to prove using the sartre smale theorem. If you just focus on simply covered orbits, then for generic families of line fields, this really will be a one dimensional manifold. It might, for instance, look like you have in this picture on the right with the sideways parabola and the horizontal axis here is the parameter. So that means as you move the parameter, first you see two orbits, then the projection to the parameter space at the critical point, in this case, a Morse critical point, and now the two orbits are gone. There's nothing there. So that's, that's a way to understand the birth-death bifurcation as a perfectly smooth phenomenon. There's another type that we have to think about in this context because of the fact that orbits can be multiply covered. So a period doubling bifurcation does the following. There's a situation where, in fact, the moduli space, the parametric moduli space that we defined here is not a smooth one dimensional manifold. It is in most places, but we see a singular point right here. Actually, the local model for that is um, the singular point in a level set of a Morse function on a surface at a saddle point. And that's really what this moduli space looks like if you have period doubling bifurcation. What you see happening is you have two orbits which are moving along. Now the thick one in blue is supposed to be a doubly covered orbit. And the thin one in red is a simply covered orbit. In the picture on the right, you see that one twice. The reason is there's a symmetry built in here. There's a Z2 action acting on this picture such that it identifies this one on the bottom with this one on the top. On the other hand, it maps this one here, which is doubly covered to itself. So that's only one orbit, and this and this together are only one orbit. And you see them as orbits moving such that at some point, the simple orbit starts to look more and more like a doubly covered orbit, and that doubly covered orbit then smashes in to the other one. Again, everything becomes degenerate. One big difference from birth death is that the doubly covered orbit just goes on its merry way. It doesn't cease to exist. And that's because, well, we have this violent thing happening here where the doubly covered orbit has become degenerate, but the simply covered orbit underneath it is just fine. That simply covered orbit was non-degenerate the whole time. It's just deforming smoothly with the parameter and it's still going to exist after the bifurcation. And therefore, so does the bubble cover. But the other family of orbits we have, that one has disappeared. So that's, that's birth-death bifurcation. Uh, theorem, sample theorem 2b, 
for generic deformations, these two are the only things that can happen. There is birth death, there is period doubling, there are no other bifurcations that could describe singularities in this moduli space or points where orbits fail to be non-degenerate. So let me add a few comments about this, just out of, out of interest. First of all, I'm going to try and interpret this as a wall crossing phenomenon. And the point is, uh, you have a one dimensional moduli space, something's going to happen whenever it crosses a wall that has co-dimension one. So you have to find out what kinds of co-dimension one walls are there. The answer is in this particular setting, there are exactly two types that have some qualitative differences. And, and that's again going to have something to do with representation theory. So a few other remarks that are, are less relevant, but I think interesting. Uh, if you assume your family of line fields to also be smoothly geodesible, meaning you have a smooth family of Riemannian metrics such that all the orbits become geodesics for those metrics, uh, then you can also show by fairly elementary argument that the components of this parametric moduli space are each compact except for the phenomenon of period doubling. The only thing that can happen is a family goes and disappears because it crashes into a doubly covered orbit that's part of a period double bifurcation. But for instance, you would also be worried in general that you have a family of orbits that are just staying in a compact subset, but their periods are getting longer and longer. And as the period blows up to infinity, they disappear. That's what's called a blue sky catastrophe. So what I'm saying here is under this geodesible condition, that cannot happen. The geodesible condition is something people who think about contact manifolds may have heard of, because if you make the additional assumption that your line field is Hamiltonian, meaning it's the characteristic line field for a closed two form of maximal rank, it's what we call a Hamiltonian structure on M, then being geodesible is equivalent to being stabilizable. That means we have a family of stable Hamiltonian structures. So for instance, this observation about blue sky catastrophes is true for deformations of contact forms. Just those give you natural stable Hamiltonian structures. But I have uh, an additional piece of, well, uh, let's not say bad news, but interesting news about the Hamiltonian case. In the case where your line fields are Hamiltonian, there are more bifurcations that can appear. So the theorem that I stated is not true. And actually there's a fairly simple way to see why that must be possible and in fact, must be allowed in general. Imagine the scenario where your manifold has dimension three, and uh, when we're looking at non-degeneracy conditions, we're looking at the spectrum of the linearized flow. So let's call this E by- so Are you writing something right now? I don't think it shows up. You're not seeing what I'm writing? No, we just see the, the slide as is. Okay, all right. I'm going to have to just say that in words then and, and revise my strategy for online teaching to start in a couple of weeks. Um, so what I want to say about this, I'll try and paint you it in the You do have a way to can... annotate. Uh, now isn't the time, however, for me to figure out what that way is. All right. So, <laughs> um, so the point is, uh, Degeneracy means the spectrum of the linearized flow of the vector field contains one. Right? Uh, and we'd be worried actually about that spectrum containing any root of unity, because that will mean not necessarily your given orbit is degenerate, but some particular multiple cover of that is degenerate. So in the Hamiltonian case, that spectrum is a spectrum of a symplectic linear map. In the non-Hamiltonian case, it's not. It doesn't have to be symplectic. That means in this case on a three manifold, uh, the eigenvalues are confined to the reals and the unit circle. And if they're on the unit circle, they come in pairs. So you might imagine you have uh, two orbits that you would like to connect to each other through a smooth family. Uh, both of them have eigenvalues which are on the unit circle, but in order to get from one to the other, you have to pass through, say, a third root of unity. And that means the triple cover of those orbits is going to become degenerate at some point. Uh, but the double cover is not. So it's not a period double bifurcation, it's something else. 
And uh, on the other hand, if you're allowed to move outside the range of Hamiltonian line fields, you can get around that because the eigenvalues don't have to stay on the unit circle. They can just go outside of it and avoid the roots of unity. So if you actually want to see what kinds of um, bifurcations can happen. There's a whole bunch of pictures in the giant book by Abraham and Marsden and the chapter on Hamiltonian dynamics. Um, questions. Since you were not able to see what I'm writing, does this mean you also cannot see my laser pointer? Uh, yeah, we also can't see the pointer. We can see your mouse though, so you may be able to move that around. Yeah. Uh, so you can see when I'm moving this thing around. Uh, okay. Actually, no. <laughs> no. All right. Good to know. So I'm going to skip over. Uh, no, was, let me say a little bit about holomorphic curves in general before we start getting into details. So. Let's say we have a two n dimensional symplectic manifold and we're considering compatible almost complex structures. So this is not a sample theorem because this, this one is one that, that I claim for myself. The dates are a little bit tricky because the preprint went on the archive in 2016, but had a serious error until 2019. So there's a range of dates. Um, in any case, if your manifold is what's called a symplectic Calabi-Yau threefold, so it means the dimension is six, and its first turn class vanishes. That's a situation where all homomorphic curves have virtual dimension, or moduli spaces have virtual dimension zero. Then the statement is that the D-bar operator intersects the zero section cleanly. So the fancy word for that is that all simple holomorphic curves are super rigid. So there's a corollary to this that directly mirrors what I described in the finite dimensional case. Uh, counts of zeros of that section in this case are gromov witten invariants. So the gromov witten invariants then can be computed as finite sums of Euler numbers of well-defined obstruction bundles. So another theorem using similar techniques is that in dimension at least four for generic J, all unbranched covers of simple J homomorphic curves are cut out transversely. In other words, they're Fredholm regular. So let me mention a precedent for this result from this paper of Taub's that I referred to earlier. Uh, the Gromov invariant was defined as a count of certain embedded holomorphic curves plus doubly covered holomorphic tori. And he didn't use any virtual methods in that paper for counting multiple covered tori. He just proved that they actually are cut out transversely. So, uh, it, one can now see that result as, as a special case of theorem 3b here, and, and uh, my proof is also a, a generalization of the ideas from that paper. Uh, Chris, before you move on, I think you have a question from uh, Denia Roof. Yeah, hi, Denia. Uh, hi. Yes, I was wondering why does clean intersection give super rigidity? Can you clarify what the meaning of clean intersection is in this case? So in this case, it, it means that the linearized cauchy riemann operator, well, first of all, it means that, that the actual moduli space you have is a smooth object of some dimension, just not the correct dimension, but also that the linearized cauchy riemann operator has kernel no larger than it absolutely has to be given the space that you see there. Um, so you can translate that. I'll mention it also later. You can do a computation to translate that into a condition that says the normal cauchy riemann operator is injective, which is often how they express super rigidity. But so doesn't that allow curves, say, with normal bundle O plus O of minus 2, which I wouldn't call super rigid? So we're thinking of spheres. Well, what would be the index of the curve in that case? Well, the index is still zero, but the kernel would be, I mean, they come in one dimensional families, but in a smooth family that is normally non-degenerate as far as I know. Oh, never mind. It is normally degenerate. Never mind. Okay. I'm glad you're happy. Okay. So, 
So let me tell you a general paradigm for attacking these problems. One thing that all of these problems talked about have in common, there is some moduli space, I'm going to call it M sigma, that's defined in, in terms of some geometric data sigma, uh, such that for every point in the moduli space, you have two things. First, there's some finite, uh, I'm using the term symmetry group in an intentionally imprecise way, because it can be different things depending on what you're doing. Uh, but there's this finite group, which is trivial on some special open subset of the moduli space for which you already know how to prove transversality. So for instance, the simple holomorphic curves, or in the orbifold setting, the points where the, the isotropy group is trivial. Secondly, there are some Fredholm operators that I'm going to call dx, so the linearized section in most cases, uh, which is surjective if and only if transversality holds at that point. So in general, here's what we'll try to do. There's three steps. First is what I call the isosymmetric strata. Uh, you decompose the moduli space into a countable set of subsets on which the symmetry information is constant. So these finite groups associated to points uh, don't change violently as you move around in these strata. And you can prove it's usually fairly easy using standard methods that for generic geometric choices, these guys are submanifolds, and you can compute their dimensions. The next part is usually harder, uh, I'm calling it the technical part, that is to construct walls inside of these strata. So we further stratify the isosymmetric strata so that on each of these substrata, the kernel and co-kernel of these Fredholm operators very smoothly. In other words, their dimensions are constant and they form well-defined vector bundles. That's of course the sort of thing you want to do if you want to talk about obstruction bundles. And then the third step is we need to understand uh, that there's a natural splitting of these operators due to the equivariance. So at each point, the associated Fredholm operator splits into a direct sum of some ends corresponding to the real irreducible representations of your symmetry group. We need to compute the indices of those sum ends. That's usually the information that we need in order to find out whether equivariant transversality is possible or not. The rest of it will then go by dimension counting. So I'll try and illustrate this with some concrete examples. Let's look at the, the finite dimensional toy model. So on our orbit bundle over our orbifold, uh, for every possible finite group, G, we can define a subset MG of the orbifold as just the, <clears throat> the set of all points at which the isotropy group is isomorphic to G. And you can show fairly easily that that's naturally a smooth manifold just using local models of, of an orbifold. And then the set of points in that that are actually in the zero set I'll denote by M MG of sigma. So the observations I mentioned in the first one already, that thing is a smooth submanifold. Secondly, take your section, restrict it to that sub-manifold. You'll notice that it always takes values in a distinguished sub-bundle because your isotropy group is also acting on the fibers. And there's a distinguished sub-bundle consisting of, of the vectors that are fixed by that action. So that's just a consequence of equivariance of the section. And now there's a, a fairly easy exercise by the sard snail theorem to show that that restricted section is transverse to the zero section of that sub-bundle. And its zero set is this isosymmetric stratum we just defined, so that is then a smooth manifold. That's the first step. Now we need to talk about the walls. The definition is pretty straightforward. So we have a, a linearization of the section at every point, uh, d sigma at x, I'm calling it dx here. And now for any non-negative integers k and c, let's define a subset of the moduli space or of the isosymmetric stratum by the condition that the dimension of the kernel of that linearization is k and the dimension of the co-kernel is c. So again, two key observations about this. Uh, there's sort of a standard trick by which you can show that the space of matrices of a given rank is a smooth submanifold of the space of all matrices. Um, that same trick works for Fredholm operators in general. So for every Fredholm operator, there's a neighborhood and a smooth map on that neighborhood whose zero set is exactly the set of nearby Fredholm operators that have kernel and co-kernel of the same dimension. 
the image of that operator is the space of linear maps from the kernel to the co-kernel. So uh, we need to keep that in mind together with the fact that in this setting, all the operators we have are G equivariant automatically. So put that all together, do a little exercise to show that a certain linearization is surjective. It's pretty easy in the finite dimensional case. We get this theorem that says, uh, for all choices of the data defining this wall, uh, for generic sections, the wall is a smooth submanifold. Its co-dimension near any given point is exactly the dimension of the space of G equivariant maps from the kernel to the co-kernel of the linearized operator at that point. So uh, that last formula for the co-dimension gives you a hint that we're about to get into representation theory because that's how you compute dimensions of spaces of equivariant linear maps. So uh, this is the third ingredient that I mentioned, the splitting of the linearization. So let's uh, choose a list of the real irreducible representations of our finite group G, call theta one the trivial representation. Now, since our linearized section at each point is equivariant, Shor's lemma guarantees that it's going to split with respect to the isotopic decompositions of the tangent space and the fiber at that point. In other words, right, for each irreducible representation, since G is acting on the tangent space, there's a corresponding subspace that's canonically defined on which G acts by some direct sum of copies of that particular irreducible representation. Those are the isotopic subspaces. Shor's lemma guarantees that an equivariant linear map is not going to intermix them with different representations. So we get now splitting of the linearization corresponding to the different irreducible representations. Observations. First, the first one in the splitting, the one that gives, is given by the trivial representation, is a linear map that we've already seen before. It's the linearization of that restricted section whose zero set is the isosymmetric straddle. So that's the one that actually we already showed was surjective for generic choices and its kernel is precisely the tangent space to the isosymmetric stratum. Second observation, uh, we're going to have transversality to the zero section at the point X, if and only if all of these sum ends are surjective. Now that's important to be aware of because it might well be that the index of this linearized section at that point is non-negative. So you'd imagine maybe generic perturbations could make it surjective, but it's a direct sum of operators, some of which might actually have negative index. And then you know it's impossible no matter what you do. So this is a, a, an algebraic obstruction transversality. If any of those operators has negative index, then equivariant transversality is clearly impossible. You need them to all be non-negative. Uh, corresponding statement about clean intersections. If the operators are all injective, except for the first one, the one for the trivial representation, uh, if the rest are all injective, what does this mean? Well, it means the kernel of the total operator is exactly the kernel of the, <coughs> the first one, which is the tangent space to the isosymmetric stratum. That's the clean intersection condition. So that condition would imply that you have a clean intersection. And that's the way to prove clean intersections in practice. Chris, you have, a, you have a question from Mohammed Awizade. Yes. Uh, I just want to, so since, since you have a non-trivial obstruction to achieving transversality by small obstruction, by small deformations, do you have examples in mind where you can, you can compute it to be non-zero? Um, the one I showed you at the beginning is an example. <clears throat> We're still in the finite dimensional toy model. So uh, that's a case where there is an index that's negative that you would need to be non-negative in order to have any hope. Can you do it with holomorphic spheres? Uh, sure, because that's, that's something that happens in this Kolabiya setting as well. So transversality is usually impossible there for obvious dimensional reasons. And you have actual negative index operators appearing there even though your virtual dimension is always zero. Thank you. Okay. So uh, now I can make precise 
this statement I, I made at the beginning that if equivariant transversality is not impossible, then it's generically true. Because what the stratification theorem now implies is if our section is generic and we're looking at a component of an isosymmetric stratum on which the indices of these summands are all non-negative everywhere, and that's, that's a condition that doesn't vary as you move around, those indices are constant. If that's true, then the section is actually going to be transverse to the zero section on an open and dense subset because the set of points where it's not true is going to be a submanifold of positive co-dimension. That's what the stratification theorem tells you. And there's a similar statement about queen intersections. Uh, so that's sometimes enough information to prove something. For instance, we can now prove that uh, Morse functions are generic on orbifolds. So now our bundle is the cotangent bundle of the orbifold. Our section is the differential of a function. We need to show that that differential is transverse to the zero section for generic functions. There's two new features that are a little bit different from what I talked about up to now. First, um, the linearized section in this case is the Hessian of a critical point. And that's not just any linear operator, that's a symmetric linear operator automatically. So that changes a few things. In particular, it changes the co-dimension formula because now the operators you're dealing with have an additional symmetry. The co-dimension of the wall becomes now instead of dimension of all geocovariance linear maps from kernel to co-kernel, it's the dimension of the symmetric linear maps from the kernel to itself. So that's a smaller number than it was before, but it's still positive. And that's enough information because we're dealing with a situation where all the summands in the splitting are automatically self-adjoint, therefore they all have index zero. So what does that imply? The isosymmetric strata uh, their dimensions are exactly the index of the first operator in that splitting, that's index zero. So those are all zero dimensional manifolds. If there's a non-Morse critical point anywhere, that lives in one of the walls, which is a positive co-dimension sub-manifold of a zero dimensional manifold, therefore it's empty. That's the proof. So this is what I mean by dimension counting as a way of proving transversality. Now, if you want to do something fancier than that, you usually need to actually compute the co-dimensions of the walls. I'm just going to write down the answer, which you can get from representation theory. Um, you need to know what is the dimension of the space of geoequivariant linear maps from kernel to co-kernel. Um, the answer is, if you know what the kernels of the summands are and, the, and what the dimensions of the co-kernels of the summands are, need one additional piece of information for each irreducible representation. Uh, since we're talking about real representations, not complex representations, the, the G-equivariant endomorphism algebra of an irreducible can be one of three things. It can be either the reals or the complex numbers or the quaternions. So its dimension is either one, two, or four, and that number factors into this formula. So well, that's what the dimension looks like. Now we can apply it to prove this theorem about clean intersections. Let's just do the special case where uh, the isotropy is always at most order two. So there are exactly two irreducible representations of Z2. Let's call them theta plus and theta minus. Uh, both of them have equivariant endomorphism algebra R. That's one dimensional. So now, the total operator is a sum of a plus part and a minus part. And we know the plus part is surjective because that's the one that's just the linearization of, of this section that we already made transverse to zero in this distinguished subbundle. Its kernel is the tangent space of the isosymmetric stratum. Uh, and also, the total index is zero because we had assumed that the dimension of the orbifold is the same as the rank of the orbibundle. So that means the index of the minus part of the operator is just minus the index of the plus part. It's less than or equal to zero, which is good news, because we want to show that that operator is injective. As I already remarked, that would imply the queen intersection condition. So, well, if it's not, uh, then our point is living in some wall that's defined by the condition dimension of the kernel of the minus part is some number k, which is positive. And if that's true, then the dimension of this co-kernel 
you can compute in terms of k and the index of the operator. Now compute what the dimension of the wall is, you find it's going to be negative as long as this number k is something positive. So again, uh, the space of points at which the clean intersection condition fails has negative dimension, therefore empty. Uh, I'm going to move on now to talking about homomorphic curves. Is there any questions before I do? Then I will move on. Oh, okay. So yeah. I, I have a question. I is it possible to like briefly say what kind of the hardships are when you go to infinite dimensions from finite dimensions? Oh, I will. Okay. I, I will say that slightly more than briefly. Okay. Yeah. So, so far, uh, none of what I've described so far is particularly difficult analytically. Um, so I want to talk about some of the things that are difficult. So I'll skip a few things because I'm, I'm going a bit slow. Um, so first thing to know, for a holomorphic curve, there's two linearized Cauchy-Riemann operators that you want to think about. The usual linearized Cauchy-Riemann operator is defined on the pulled back tangent bundle, but this is also the normal operator. Um, it's sort of obvious what this is if your holomorphic curve is immersed and has a well-defined normal bundle. Slightly less obvious that you can always define it even if there are critical points. Uh, there's still a good notion of a normal bundle. Uh, something to be a little bit careful about is that if you then move your curve around in the moduli space, critical points can appear and disappear. And when that happens, the topology of that normal bundle will change. Um, on the other hand, the normal cauchy riemann operator is a nice thing because it is actually an operator that is surjective if and only if the curve is cut out transversely. And you could also use it to describe the super rigidity condition. So uh, a, an index zero immersed curve is super rigid if and only if all of its multiple covers have injective normal cauchy riemann operators. So that's a, a nice condition that you can try to prove using these dimension counting instruments. So we're going to focus on the normal operator. That just means we have to be a little bit careful to make sure that on our isosymmetric strata, it varies continuously. We don't want to let the topology of the normal bundle change as the curve moves around the stratum. So we define the stratum like this. It's a space of compositions of simple curves with holomorphic branched covers, where the simple curve V varies among all simple curves that have a prescribed number of critical points and each one of a prescribed order. So that condition uh, makes sure that the topology of the generalized normal bundle cannot change as this curve moves around. Uh, and one can compute uh, that for generic J, the moduli space of those things is a smooth submanifold of, of a certain dimension. And then the branched cover is moving around also not among all branched covers, but among all branched covers that have a prescribed number of critical values, each one with a prescribed number of pre-images with prescribed branching order. So it's a lot of information to keep track of. But it guarantees, for instance, that as that thing moves around, its automorphism group doesn't change. That's what we mean by isosymmetric. So uh, the following is pretty easy to prove using standard transversality theory for simple curves. Uh, this stratum we just defined will be a smooth manifold for generic J. Its dimension is something one can compute. And of course, the normal cauchy riemann operator is very smoothly. So now I need to talk about the splitting. And that takes a little bit more time because uh, there's some non-obvious aspects to this. So let me first talk about the obvious case. The obvious case is where you're looking at a two-fold cover. So your normal cauchy riemann operator for the double cover is a pullback of the normal cauchy riemann operator for the underlying simple curve. And in the case of degree two, you have the nice feature that there is exactly one non-trivial deck transformation. So there's an obvious splitting of the space of sections of a pullback bundle into the symmetric sections plus the anti-symmetric sections, those which are either invariant under the deck transformation or they change sign under the deck transformation. So that gives you a natural splitting of, of your cauchy riemann operator on the pullback into a plus part and a minus part. This is unfortunately a bit difficult to generalize uh, because, for instance, if the degree is greater than two, there might not be any non-trivial automorphisms. Its covers don't have to be regular. So 
this is where uh, we borrow an idea that comes originally from that Taub's paper. We're going to replace the space of sections along the, uh, the pullback bundle with sections of some twisted version of the underlying bundle by tensoring that bundle with some flat vector bundle. So uh, before we can do that, we need to uh, actually talk about honest covering maps instead of branched covers, uh, which is something we can do if we're willing to remove finitely many points. But of course, then we have a punctured Riemann surface instead of a closed Riemann surface. That's OK, because there's this lemma you can prove using asymptotic regularity results that says, if you remove a finite set and now restrict your Cauchy Riemann operator to the punctured domain, uh, define it on some exponentially weighted Sobolev spaces where there's a small exponential growth condition allowed at the puncture, then you get something that has the same index and the same kernel as your original operator. So for our purposes, you can replace the operator on the closed surface with this one on the punctured domain. And now we look at our branch cover as an honest covering map of punctured Riemann surfaces and look up some covering space theory in Hatcher's book and find out we can always do the following. Our given covering map might not be regular. It might not have any automorphisms, but there is always some distinguished regular cover that factors through it. Uh, and in fact, you can always present a given cover in this way. You take your regular cover with some finite automorphism group G. There's some injective homomorphism of that group into a symmetric group on D elements, such that uh, without loss of generality, your original surface is precisely this thing here. So the product of the, the, the big surface, the big cover with uh, D elements, divide that by the obvious action of the group and have an obvious projection. Is that a question? There was someone pressing their mute button on the accident. I think you, you do have a question from uh, Ji Zhang. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, do we have some reference for the asymptotic regularity? You know? um, various papers by Hofer, Vysotsky, Sander, and possibly Seifrin. Okay. Uh, I think for what you need in this particular lemma, the, uh, the appendix of Seifrin's uh, paper on, on relative asymptotic formulas is where I would usually look. Okay, thank you. Um, so here's what we can now do if we have this picture. Given some representation of our finite group that just appeared on the previous slide, uh, we define some flat vector bundle. We, we take the trivial vector bundle with fiber, the representation space along a big covering space and then divide that by the obvious action of the group G. When D acting by, it's acting by deck transformations on, on the base and it's acting by the representation on the fiber. So if we now tensor that bundle with our, our original normal bundle of a simple homomorphic curve, it inherits a cauchy riemann operator in a natural way because of the fact that the, the bundle we're tensoring with has a flat structure on it. So here's a very nice observation. If you take in particular your homomorphism we had from G to the symmetric group, that turns into a permutation representation. Uh, take that as your representation of G. Uh, then for the twisted bundle we get, there is a natural identification between the space of sections of that twisted bundle and the space of sections of the original bundle pulled back along the branched cover, or in this case, an obvious uh, honest covering map. And that identification actually identifies our pulled back Cauchy Riemann operator with this twisted version of the Cauchy Riemann operator. So now we can replace the pullback bundles with these twisted bundles. Uh, so this is what the general splitting of, of the normal Cauchy Riemann operator looks like. All you have to do is say, uh, since this permutation representation splits somehow into a direct sum of irreducibles, the Cauchy Riemann operator has a corresponding splitting uh, into a direct sum of the corresponding twisted Cauchy Riemann operators. So I'm obviously not going to get into the, the details on this because there's no time, but an important remark, if you want to know why the super rigidity result is true, uh, 
uh, in the case where your original operator has index zero, um, you make this twisted bundle construction, compute the index of the twisted operator using the punctured riemann roch formula, you always get something less than or equal to zero, right? If that weren't true, we would be in big trouble. Then super rigidity would be definitely false because it's a clean intersection condition. What we wanted to prove is that the normal operator for the cover is injective and it splits into a direct sum of these twisted operators. So they had better all be uh, non-positive index so that you could potentially make them injective. I, I call this 45% of the reason why the super rigidity result is true. Okay, now let's talk about the walls. Uh, this is the answer to Joe's question, what becomes hard in the infinite dimensional case that wasn't hard before? Um, we define the walls, of course, by fixing the dimensions of the kernel and co-kernel of the Cauchy-Riemann operator and, and each of its summands within the isosymmetric strata. Um, what kind of structure are they going to have? Well, of course, uh, just as in the finite dimensional case, you can call that thing the zero set, locally the zero set of some map to the space of equivariant linear maps from kernel to co-kernel. And you could write down the derivative of that map without too much trouble with respect to some variation in the operator. You just uh, have T operating on elements of the kernel. That sends you to some bundle value zero one form and now project that to the co-kernel. That's the derivative. You want to show that it's surjective. So you can use the implicit function theorem and then this wall will have exactly the co-dimension it's supposed to. So why is this derivative surjective? Um, well, what makes the infinite dimensional case harder is we're not just perturbing the operator arbitrarily, we're perturbing the almost complex structure. And that perturbs the operator by zeroth order perturbations. So that's far from being all perturbations, that's a specific class of them. Uh, it means we need to be able to realize any equivariant map from kernel to co-kernel uh, by choosing some bundle map and plugging it in as that first operator that I called T before. So um, does that work or not? Well, if not every map from kernel to co-kernel can be found in that way, uh, what we can do is, is express these maps in terms of matrix elements with respect to some basis. So choose the north normal basis of the kernel and of the co-kernel. Uh, think of the co-kernel as the kernel of the formal adjoint. That makes it a bit easier. Uh, the matrix elements look like this expression that you see on the bottom of the screen, uh, the L2 inner product of A, A to I with Xi, J. Those are your basis elements of kernel and co-kernel. A is your bundle map, the, the zeroth order perturbation. So uh, if you can't achieve every possible map from kernel to co-kernel this way, it means there's something orthogonal to those matrix elements. There's some non-trivial set of coefficients, C, I, J, such that the sum of those coefficients times these matrix elements is zero. Let's write that in a slightly fancier way. That means for all of those A's, following expression has to vanish. We express it as an integral of a, a bilinear map at the bundle metric composed with another linear map on a tensor product acting on a certain section of the tensor bundle of the normal bundle with the, the target bundle of the cauchy riemann operator. So you're going to be in big trouble if that section of that tensor bundle happens to vanish identically. Uh, it's pretty easy to show that if that doesn't vanish identically, then you're fine. Then you'll get a contradiction from this. So that turns out to be the main consideration and it leads us into a, a condition that we need to check, which I sometimes call a quadratic unique continuation property. Uh, and this is the answer to the question, if I want to apply these ideas to my favorite nonlinear elliptic PDE, what do I need to prove? You need to prove something like this. Uh, a real linear partial differential operator on some Euclidean vector bundles satisfies what's called Petri's condition. If the canonical map from the kernel of the operator tensored with the kernel of its formal adjoint to the space of sections of a tensor bundle restricted to some open subset or any given open subset, that needs to be injected. So 
one needs to stare at it for a while to think about exactly what that condition means and play around with it. It's telling you something about the relationship between global linear independence in the space of solutions to a PDE versus pointwise linear independence. Um, and I mean, what I've been describing leads up to a kind of meta theorem, which I learned more or less from Alexander Duan and Thomas Walpuski, uh, which again is not something one can express very precisely, but basically we would say equivariant transversality problems are tractable for elliptic operators that satisfy that these conditions. So example one, uh, Sometimes you can definitely do this because, for instance, if you have an elliptic operator on a one-dimensional domain, that means you're talking about ODEs. And solutions to ODEs are uniquely determined by their values at a point. So those solutions are never zero. And that means if you have a set of, of solutions that are globally linearly independent, they're also linearly independent at every point. That means actually this Petri map gives you something that never vanishes. So that's good news. That in particular makes problem two tractable, uh, the problem about the closed orbits, right? The linearizations in that case are elliptic operators on S1. Uh, here's a non-example. Take a complex line bundle with the standard cauchy riemann operator d bar. Its formal adjoint is minus d. So the solutions to the formal adjoint equation are, are anti-holomorphic functions. Uh, and here's just a, an example you can write down of something that's in the kernel of the Petri map made out of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic functions, at which point, if you're trying to prove something about holomorphic curves and a stratification theorem, you might panic slightly. So the reason you don't need to panic is the following technical lemma. I'm stating it now in, in a somewhat more technical form than we would actually need, just because Stating it this way gives you a bit of a hint as to how one can prove it. So we will say for each natural number L, there exists an integer K greater than or equal to L and a bare set of compatible almost complex structures, J, such that for every simple holomorphic curve uh, and every point on its domain, if you have a bunch of local solutions to the normal cauchy riemann equation and its formal adjoint equation near that point, just locally, and construct a tensor product out of them. If that tensor product vanishes to order L at that point, then its image under the Petri map will not vanish to order K at that point. So for any non-trivial tensor product, I should say. Uh, so that guarantees that Petri's condition will hold. And in fact, it'll hold them on any open subset and this will be true for all normal cauchy riemann operators. Um, now, quick remark on the proof. I'm just going to say you need Sard the sard smale theorem and there's a dimension counting argument. You do it in spaces of finite jets of sections at a given point. Um, that's why we have these conditions about things vanishing to order whatever. Uh, and so then it really becomes a, a finite dimensional analysis at some point showing in these jet spaces that this condition of, of having the Petri map vanish to order whatever at that point is over determined as soon as you make that order large enough. Um, so last remark about that, I stated the, the, the lemma about simple holomorphic curves, but it's a purely local statement, right? So in the proof, you need to prove something about simple curves for the usual reasons. Uh, for sard smale theorem, you need to define some universal moduli space, which you need to prove is smooth. And uh, you have problems with that if you don't have a, an injective point somewhere to work with. But the statement of the lemma is purely local. If it's true, then it's also true for all the multiple covers of that curve. That's a very useful fact uh, that arises from, from this particular way of proving Petri's condition. Um, right. So I think I'm out of time. I could say a little bit more about the closed orbit problem and uh, bifurcations, but uh, maybe this is a good stopping point. <laughs>
So I'll stop. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. So let's um, let's first thank Chris, and then we can people whoever wants to can stick around for a question section. So as an experiment, let's try to have everyone unmute and clap. See how that works. So are there, are there any other questions for Chris? What's your hope for multiply covered uh, asymptotically cylindrical curves in dimension greater than two? Uh, something is true, uh, but it depends on index computations that need to be done somewhat carefully. So um, it is not true that all unbranched covers are going to be regular because the, there are obvious counter examples to that where the behavior of commutator indices for iterates uh, makes indices negative when you don't want them to be. So you need to place some condition on the asymptotic orbits in order for something like that to be true. It's definitely true uh, if you, you have a situation where uh, for all the orbits, commutator indices just scale linearly with the covering multiplicity. Uh, so you'd still probably have to do something with obstruction bundle gluing to handle branch covers with trivial cylinders because that's probably pretty hopeless when you're... Yeah, I mean, uh, obstruction bundle gluing isn't going away anytime soon. On the bright side, uh, so I mean, the stratification theorem I'm describing certainly works in the setting of asymptotically cylindrical homomorphic curves in cobordisms or in things like Zeeson's, whatever. Uh, that gives you a fairly powerful tool, tool for proving the existence of obstruction bundles. Okay, oh, so you could, okay. So at least uh, some of the obstruction bundles that need to exist, for instance, in order to prove invariance of embedded contact homology within a holomorphic curve setting uh, will certainly come from this. And, and in some sense, it's, that that's a natural extension of what Taubes did because that's that's why Taubes developed this in the first place, just in the closed set. Right. And if you're uh, if you're not appealing to other tricks such as like these magic tricks and whatever, um, do you, is it necessarily true that your work wouldn't apply to the cases where you have on for punctured curves the branch? Uh, sorry, the you're kind of like branched at the orbits. That that makes sense. Like, is it necessarily the case that you're Stuff can't apply there, or maybe in certain cases that it could apply there. Try and say that again. I didn't follow. Where you're considering multiple covers of curves that might be uh, unbranched covers, but kind of like at, at the orbits you have um, covering multiplicity and two ends hitting the same orbit. Well, I, my work will always apply and it will say something, but what it says might not be straightforward. Uh, and in the setting that you're probably wondering about, it's probably going to depend on something like the ECH partition condition. Yeah. Wait, can I, so just this statement about the existence of obstruction bundles, was the statement that you, like this, the fact that you have this Petri condition theorem tells you that for punctured curves, you, the obstruction bundle sort of always exists for generic J? Well, okay, we need to be a little bit careful with that statement. What, what it does tell you is that the moduli space admits a stratification into smooth submanifolds, each of which individually has a well-defined obstruction bundle on it. So uh, that's, that's not enough information for most applications, but what one can then try to do is by dimension counting arguments, uh, prove that there's only one stratum there. And that's, that's how the super rigidity result works. Okay, thank you. So an awful lot in the end depends on computing indices and then playing around with the numbers. Other questions? Ah. How nice is the stratification in the normal direction? What does that mean? Well, it means that, sorry, I have a baby in my hand, so she'll start crying soon. Um, I sympathize. If you're in the embedded case, 
if, you know, certain things are embedded in ambient space, I can ask for things to be with me stratified or something like that. Um, do you have any idea for how to describe the behavior, the, the structures from one stratum to the next? And in a finite dimensional situation, ah. if I do it, what happens in infinite dimension? Um, that's a good question. It's something I haven't thought about enough. So it's sort of on my agenda to, to sit down with it a bit. Um, I mean, the implicit function theorem should tell you something about that, but you have to look at the whole operator with all its summands in situations where the operator is not surjective, but it is something which you have control over and figure out what that tells you. I think the answer is not so straightforward, but one should be able to say something. I mean, a related question is what happened, you know, you haven't talked at all about gluing. You know, no. somehow everything you've said is about the interior of the moduli space. You know, is there yeah. something to be said? Uh, about Probably. The ability of these of these stratifications of gluing. Uh, the answer is probably, but uh, I haven't thought about it yet. As far as I know, no one has. I have a question. Is there like a kind of orbifold version of surf theory? Like, can you prove things like a generic? One parameter family of functions on orbifold undergoes only you know, like a birth death. Uh, yeah, I think probably one can do stuff like that. I, I don't know too precisely what it would. Uh, this, so this is in the in the category of um, stuff that I sort of would like to sit down and think about when I have infinite free time, but I'm not terribly motivated to do so because I have. Uh, harder infinite dimensional things to do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, these ideas should definitely say something interesting about that. Uh, you're going to have a wider zoo of, of bifurcations than you would see in the non-equivariant case, where as what's on the last few slides I didn't get to talking about bifurcations of closed orbits, but I mean, these you have different walls that correspond to kernels or co-kernels appearing in different summats for different irreducible representations. And depending which irreducible representation is appearing, uh, you get qualitative differences in the types of bifurcations that can appear. So period doubling, uh, birth death is what happens when it's only the trivial representation involved. Period doubling is what happens when it's the non-trivial representation of V2. And uh, in general, if you want to talk about uh, ray orbits for contact forms or something like that, you'll also have to uh, consider other representations of larger finite cyclic groups, uh, which produce other representations. Um, so that's, that's all stuff that also in finite dimensional toy models uh, can lead to some quite interesting pictures, I think. But uh, I haven't had time to sit down and think about it seriously. Are there any questions, other questions? Okay, well, uh, thanks again for the fantastic talk. And um, just as a reminder, there will be another talk uh, at 3 p.m. today by uh, Hang Yuan. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Kurt. I like the cat behind you, Chris. Yeah, I forgot what's behind me. Oh, that cat. Yeah. Is that the one that you got with Klaus Niederkruger? Or is that a different cat? Uh, I don't know what cat that would be off the head. I remember there was like something in your kitchen that Klaus found at a Berlin flea market. Well, that was a nutcracker. Oh, okay. It is still here somewhere. You must have had a lot of fun making those slides. <laughs> <laughs>
I should actually go have dinner. Okay, enjoy so dinner. I will sign off. Okay, yeah. thanks again. Enjoy your dinner.